Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Odin's Movie Blog. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope we're doing well. And today I'll be giving my top 10 movies of 2019. Finally, the top 10 list. There was one movie that I was still holding off on that had a limited release in December. Finally got a wide release this weekend. Was able to see it last night. Gave a review for it. And now I am ready to give my top 10 of the year. But before I get into my top 10 list, I did want to do a little promotion. So as of right now, the Wednesday Raven Awards. This is the second year that we're doing it. It's an award show that I do on the channel. It's meant to be a boycott alternative to shows like the Oscars, where it's just a bunch of hoity-toity rich people patting each other on the back and not really speaking for the fans. And so this is something that is decided on by the fans, not only the nominees, but of course the winners as well. And so this is an example of the ballot you would find. The one thing I will say is that for the best movie of 2019, the way that you have to be able to uh, to choose it is you have to rank your movies in order from favorite to least favorite. So your favorite movie would go on top, your least favorite would go on bottom. And this way, it actually leads us to what is the most popular choice out of them all and not just simply a popularity contest. It works a little bit different, kind of a weighted system. Usually, it still ends up working out where the film that is the most loved wins because that's kind of the whole point of it all. There's a bunch of really great categories and a lot of interesting nominations nominations to say the least so if you want to check that out click the link below in the video and now I'll be using my Letterboxd account to be able to show you my top movies of the year. If you want to follow me over on Letterboxd, it's letterboxd.com slash Odin Movie Blog. Sadly, it is not Odin's Movie Blog because of a mistype and you have to go pro in order to change it. But if you want to follow me for uh, quick reviews and quick ratings of films and, and other lists that I'll be making, go check me out over on Letterboxd. It's a really cool site, a really cool community, especially when it comes to logging movies. But uh, without any further ado whatsoever, let's go into my honorable mention, starting off with something that is more of a dishonorable honorable mention, and that is for the movie The Fanatic. The Fanatic is a 2019 film directed by Fred Durst, that's right, Fred Durst of Limp Biscuit fame, and this movie is not good. As you can see, I gave it a 2 out of 5 stars, and I think that was definitely being very generous to it, but the... <laughs> The performance that John Travolta gives in this movie is just nothing short of spectacular. He totally buys into the character. You don't know exactly what he's trying to do on screen, but ever since his first line of, I got a poo, you are just immediately hooked on the film. And if you want to see a movie where John Travolta is being a crazed fan, following and stalking someone that he's a huge fan of, I would highly recommend this film. I say that it's this decade's The Room. If you thought that a movie like The Room by Tommy Wiseau was a funny, uh, awesome experience, like one of the best, worst movies of all time, I think The Fanatic would be an excellent choice for you. So this one gets an honorable mention coming in at my number 15 slot of the year uh, because obviously it's just so freaking hysterical. Coming in at number 14, though, getting into movies that I actually authentically liked and thought were good at number 14 is Pokemon Detective Pikachu. This is a movie I did not think that I would like because Pokemon's kind of gone off in a direction that I have not been a fan of. I am an originalist. I am a 151 Pokemon type person. I used to play the Game Boy, uh, Game Boy Red game. That was my jam back in the day. Starter Pokemon, always Charmander. And it was awesome. I went into this film because, hey, Ryan Reynolds was doing the voice of Detective Pikachu, and I thought, hey, I really like the work of Ryan Reynolds. It could be pretty funny. The trailers looked entertaining. And guess what? The film overall was an extremely entertaining film. In fact, I would recommend you go out and actually buy or rent this movie because it is a damn good time at the movies. And I, now, obviously, now that it's out on Blu-ray and DVD and all that kind of stuff, I think it's a good movie to watch at home, and it's a great film to watch with the family, and that's what I love about it. It's not just a kid's movie that goes for the cheap kid's jokes. It's a family film that I think anyone in the family can enjoy, so coming in at number 14 is Pokemon Detective Pikachu, a great film and a whole lot of fun. Coming in at number 13 is a movie that is definitely close to the heart because I am, of course, a wrestling fan, and so therefore, number 13 is Fighting With My Family. This is a film by Stephen Merchant. 
Merchant, which tells the story of an actual real-life wrestler, Paige, and how she got her start. Basically, she came from a very hardcore wrestling family. They started their own wrestling school, and it's very interesting to see the story that she goes on from basically being with her family, trying to defend her family, to eventually trying out for the WWE and getting in to the WWE. Now, these aren't really spoilers because this has been a part of her life, and if you have watched wrestling, you already know the story. If you don't know the story, the film has been out long enough to where I feel like we are far past the spoiler warning, but this film is fantastic. Florence Pugh, I think, gives a breakout performance. She is the woman that plays Paige, so she's right up here on the right. I think that she does a fantastic job. Everyone in this movie is great. You even have people like Nick Frost in here who plays her dad, and of course, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is in there as well. So this is a film that I think is a lot of fun, and you don't have to be a wrestling fan to enjoy. Do I think you will get some of the jokes and appreciate things a little bit more if you're a wrestling fan? Yes, but you don't have to be a wrestling fan to enjoy it, and so therefore, I think it is absolutely absolutely fantastic. So that's my number 13 film of the year. Coming in at number 12 is the film Yesterday. This is a film that no one saw, sadly. The box office for this film was not very good, and that is a film by Danny Boyle called Yesterday. And it's a movie that takes place in a universe where one day the character wakes up and no one has ever heard of the Beatles except for him. So he remembers all of the songs, all of the lyrics, and he realizes, hey, I'm a struggling musician. I know all of the lyrics and all of the music for one of the greatest bands of all time that now the entire world has forgotten about. Let me try and make some money off of it. And so it goes on the story about how he handles that, how he handles his new fandom, and eventually what happens towards the end, which I won't get into spoilers, but I'm sure you can figure out that something crazy happens because when you have an entire premise based on the world forgetting something, obviously some crazy things and some lesson learning is going to happen. But the overall acting of the film was really, really solid. So uh, Hamish Patel was fantastic. Lily James, who um, some people might know, she was in the live action version of Cinderella not too long ago. She was also the love interest in Baby Driver as well. Uh, very talented. They have a lot of really great chemistry on screen together. And Danny Boy is a fantastic filmmaker, so I think that that is a wonderful film that everyone should check out. Coming in for the last of my honorable mentions at number 11 is a film that was on my top 10 list for quite a while, and it is a film that I think I would love to see more of, not necessarily sequels to this movie specifically, but rather more movies set in this universe, and that is, of course, Brightburn. So Brightburn asked the question, what if a child from another world crash-landed on Earth, but instead of becoming hero to mankind, he, becomes to become, he, he starts to become something more sinister? So basically, it's the story, what if Superman went bad? And it definitely shows what happens when a younger child going through puberty, going through those teenage years, who's being bullied, etc., realizing he has powers and that he can do a lot of damage and that no one can stop him, what kind of person that he would become. So it is really interesting. Some of the kills are very gruesome. It's very disturbing a lot of the time, which I think is exactly what a lot of us wanted out of this movie. And it made me wanting more, to be perfectly honest. So are they going to do a sequel to this? I kind of hope they do. Not necessarily a direct sequel. They don't have to necessarily pick up where this character leaves off. It would just be really cool to see what if we lived in a world where the superhero characters that we've been so used to didn't grow up the way that they had. What if the superheroes become the supervillains? And even more so, what if the supervillains become the superheroes? I think that could be a very interesting backwards uh, universe. You could obviously have almost like a bizarro type universe in this way. And this film is just fantastic for that very reason. So uh, wonderful job all around. This is actually a movie that has Elizabeth Banks in it that I didn't hate. So that should speak volumes because you all know how critical I can be of her. All right, now starting the actual top 10 list. Coming in at number 10 is Shazam. Uh, I think that this is the best DC Extended Universe film yet so far. Better than Aquaman, better than even Wonder Woman. I think that this this was the best. It is genuinely a funny movie. I found myself laughing so much at it. And the reason why I say it's my favorite DC Extended is because obviously when you have films, you know, like other DC films that have come out this year that seem to take place more in an isolated in their own world, this movie, I believe, is still supposed to be a part of the broader universe, including the characters of Aquaman and Wonder Woman. I think that we could see uh, Zachary Levi's Shazam come into that and, and be that character in those films in the future. And Zachary Levi just, I think, knocks it out of the park with this character. I think all of the, you know, just 
just all the chemistry that exists between all the different characters. The kid actors are fantastic. Mark Strong plays a bad guy so well, and he does that once again in this film. Um, you know, Asher, An uh, Asher Angel and Jack Dylan Grazer as the kid actors in this film, also great. And Jaman Hansu, of course, is always great to see in films as well, playing uh, the wise man, and it is just fantastic. And I'm sure I messed that up, and someone's going to come after me in the comments. But again, that's why I always say I'm really not a comics guy, but seeing this on screen, it was definitely a great film to watch, and I would definitely recommend it. I own it on uh, 4K Steelbook, and it just looks freaking gorgeous. So that is my number 10 film. Coming in at number 9 is the movie Doctor Sleep. This is a sequel that I never really knew that I wanted. It was the one I never knew that I, you know, I never knew I wanted to see what happened to Danny Torrance after the events of The Shining. This film came out and I was just blown away. The film was so meticulous. It was so slowly paced. Mike Flanagan did a great job just building up these characters, building up the tension. I do think the end, the last 15 to 20 minutes, feels extremely rushed. However, I've been told that there's going to be an extended cut on the Blu-ray release of this film. So I'm hoping that with that extra extra footage, it's able to kind of fill in those gaps and maybe make the ending not seem so rushed, because obviously I don't know where that extra footage is coming in, but everything except the ending of this film is just freaking fantastic, and it's a movie that I think went under a lot of people's radars, and I came out of it enjoying it so much. Ewan McGregor does a fantastic job. Rebecca Ferguson plays a wonderful uh, evil um, villain in this movie as well, and of course you've got wonderful uh, actors, young uh, younger actors working in this film, and a great supporting cast as well. Coming in now at my number seven film of the year is a movie that started off as my number one film of the year, but as more movies came out, the film had to naturally go down, but it does not mean that I do not love it. And so therefore coming in at my number seven film of the year would be, or at home, make sure I'm in the right spot here. So number 10, number nine, my number eight film of the year is Alita Battle Angel. What else can I really say about this movie? The visuals for this film are fantastic. Rosa Salazar's uh, motion capture performance is flawless. The fact that she's able to convey so much emotion just goes to show you how great and natural of an actor that she is. Christoph Waltz playing Doc Otto in the film is fantastic. Everyone, everyone in the supporting cast is great. And it's a film that did not make a whole lot of the box office, sadly enough. So I'm really hoping that we do get an Alita sequel. And I know that the hashtag Alita Army is working very hard to make that happen. And I, of course, always will fully support any movement that will be pushing for this film because this film is how you should do uh, anime characters. I think that this is pretty much the new standard, in my opinion, of how to adapt uh, anime characters, uh, cartoon characters into live action characters. Now, I know I'm not saying that anime and cartoons are the same. I'm just saying to take an animated version of a character into a live action, I think that this really does help set the stage in that way. Coming in at my number seven film of 2019 is Ford v. Ferrari. This film just was magic from start to finish. J directed by James Mangold, who is also known for making films like Logan. This is a movie that is made for car lovers, but non-car lovers can also enjoy it as well. It is fast-paced, just like the cars on screen. It makes you care about the characters. It makes you care about what's going on. The movie that I compared this to in my original review was the movie Warrior, where the Warrior dealt a lot with UFC-type fighting, cage fighting, which I have no interest in. But then I saw this movie and said to myself, oh my goodness, this film is absolutely freaking fantastic, and everyone in here is great. And I really think, and I'm sad that Ford v. Ferrari is not getting a whole lot of love this award season and that it really didn't make a whole lot at the um, worldwide box office. In fact, it's still, based on the numbers that I have, still has not made back its money um, at, at least when you look at the raw box office totals. Hopefully, because of a lot of the promos in there, I think there was a Coca-Cola promo and of course, you know, Ford Company, Ferrari Company, hopefully that gave it some extra revenue so that way they did indeed make some money and profit off of it because it is just a wonderful film overall. Still lost where I am and that's the reason why I love doing this thing live because it is just how I go. So that's my one, two, three, four, uh, five. So coming in at my number six film of 2019 is a movie that is a little bit too long, but because it's done by an absolute master of cinema, it had to make it onto my list. So my number six film 
is The Irishman by Martin Scorsese. This is a beautiful mob epic. It's great to see Martin Scorsese go back to his uh, his mob roots making these types of films. I think that every single shot is so well crafted. The acting is spot on. I think that these actors give some of the best performances of their career. Al Pacino uh, doing a great job, of course. Joe Pesci, to me, I think is the unsung hero because normally he's a character that's just crazy and wacky. A lot of you remember him from films like Home Alone or, or maybe if you're Alex McCarthy, you think of him uh, more from a film like the Lethal Weapon film. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, instead, in this one, he is a quiet, but he is yet powerful, and he just owns the screen and, and has such a screen presence on there. And it's really sad that a lot of these people are being overlooked uh, when it comes to the award seasons. But overall, this is a fantastic film, great cast. And Martin Scorsese is always able to get some really great performances out of his actors. And this is no exception. All right, now cracking into my top five movies of the year. Coming in at number five is a movie that also was at the top of my list in the very beginning of the year. And it is still one of my all-time favorites. And that, of course, is John Wick Chapter 3. Parabellum. Uh, this is the third film in the John Wick franchise. To me, this has the best action sequences of any of the John Wick movies, mostly because of that knife fight sequence. I mean, the very beginning with the knife fight sequence is just so damn good and impressive. And the stunt teams and the stunt work and the practical visual effects that they use in the film and the coloring. I mean, just look at that poster and look at that background. It just screams quality. And even though the story... It's getting started. It's starting to get a little muddied at this point because they obviously set up some very interesting things with the lore of this universe, with the continental and everything else going on, the high table in the second film. They try and kind of go along and continue along with that story in this film, but I think they try and do a little too many things story wise. But luckily enough, the action is able to make up for the lack of really story clarity. And so I'm hoping that once we get chapter four, they're able to kind of tighten up the story just a little bit, keep us focused on the action outdo themselves in this film and I think we could have ourselves another great time. This is also a franchise that continues to grow. Every film has made more money as the franchise has gone on because more people have become fans of it overall. So John Wick Chapter 3, definitely deserving to be in my top 5 films of 2019. Coming in at number 4, this was the movie that I needed to see. This was the movie that I thought this could possibly change my list just a little bit. Didn't come in exactly where I thought it might, but still broke into my top five. And that, of course, is 1917. What can I say? This is the probably the most beautiful film that I have seen this year. The cinematography that Roger Deakins does is just spectacular. I had a review that went on the channel last night. I highly recommend you go see it because, oh my goodness, this film by Sam Mendes is damn near flawless. The fact that you have a movie that features two characters that have some dialogue but really don't have anything that heavy as far as dialogue goes, and yet you learn so much about them to the point where you care about every single thing they do, I think is an extremely impressive feat, not to mention all of the sequencing that happens in this movie to make it seem like one take. For those that don't know, this film is shot as if it is one take. And if you have not seen the 10 to 20 minute behind the scenes video on YouTube that goes into how they were able to do so, please do yourself a favor and watch it because, oh my goodness, it is truly incredible to see the ways in which they're able to make this film seamlessly go from shot to shot and also the impressive sets that they build for it especially the the uh, the trenches i mean they've built miles and miles it seems of trenches that the camera crew have to squeeze into with all of these actors and there's all of this choreography they spent i think 4 months practicing the choreography of the shots before they actually started to put it onto print so it's amazing how much work went into it. You can obviously see the amount of work and the amount of dedication that went into this film. And that's the reason why this comes in as my number four film of the year, because it is definitely the best shot movie of the year. The score is brilliant. The acting is solid and it's just so beautiful. It's a film that I already want to go see again because it's so immersive with the way that the film is shot and the true magic of Roger Deakins behind the camera as the cinematographer. So kudos to 1917 for breaking into my top five list. Coming in now to the number three movie of the year. This is a movie that I love. And the more I watch it and the more clips of it that I watch, the more I fall in love with it. And it's starting to climb up one of us as to be one of my favorite of all time Quentin Tarantino films. And that is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, Brad Pitt 
is really the steals the show, steals the movie, Brad Pitt. Whether it's the fight that he has with Bruce Lee, whether it's him at the end with all the crap that goes on with that entire final that the entire final sequence alone makes the entire film worth it. Now, some people are trying to say uh, the end scene is really the only thing worth talking about. But I think the slow burn that you get throughout the rest of the film and just all of the meticulous stuff that Quentin Tarantino does. I mean, when you look just to the background of every single shot and you realize that he's using authentic materials from the 1960s, he's using authentic uh, brands, authentic signs from that time period to make everything look as if you are seeing what it would have looked like back then. Not to mention this dude continues to use actual film reels to make his movies so that he is literally filming it as if it were a movie being filmed at the same time in history. There's just so much craft that goes into Quentin Tarantino's films. And this movie is yet another major triumph on his part with a great cast, great story. And as I said, the more I watch it and the more I look into it, the more I fall in love with it. So this film easily comes in as my number three film of 2019. Now, coming into the top two movies of the year, this has been the biggest fight. This has been the biggest struggle because I think both of these films as my top two are great for different reasons. And I could see myself in the future flipping back and forth between them, to be perfectly honest, because they're both great for different reasons. But coming in at my number two movie of 2019 is indeed the movie Parasite, the foreign language film that won my heart, directed by Bong Joon-ho, who has done movies in the past that I have not been a huge fan of. But when I went into this movie and the subtitles just melted away and I was able just to see all of these amazing actors on screen, relative unknowns, of course, to Western audiences, just killing it and be making me believe that they were who they were portraying to be, making them look like actual real people and making you realize that it's not simply rich versus poor and that there's a good guy and a bad guy and that people are flawed no matter who they are. The fact that we got every character in this film, whether they were rich or poor, being a flawed character was just downright perfection in so many different ways. I love this movie. I cannot wait to go out and buy this film. I'm praying this film gets a 4K release with extra footage because I would love to see a lot of the behind the scenes on this. Right now, I think it's just getting a regular standard Blu-ray release. But if this gets a 4K release, I definitely plan on buying it. This is one of the best films of the year. It is also one of these gender, <laughs> it's also one of these uh, genre benders, as it were, because it starts off as almost this comedy drama, but then it jumps and becomes a thriller out of nowhere. But it does it so seamlessly and it all works and every scene just seems like it's just so well placed. I cannot praise this film enough. If you have a chance to rent it or to watch it, I recommend it. Please do yourself a favor and watch it because this is going to be a film, I think, to watch. It got nominated for six Oscars. That's going to be an entirely different video, but this is a movie that deserves the praise that it's getting, and I hope more and more people come to see it. And that means that, of course, without any surprise, I think, from people that have been watching my channel, the number one movie of 2019 for me is Joker. I mean... Joker is a film that is just like Parasite, almost downright flaw flawless. Now, the biggest criticism that a lot of people give to this film is that it seems to be inspired by films that previously happened, films like Taxi Driver or uh, you know Kings, of, you know uh, uh, the King of Comedy. And I understand that people can find those similarities, but when you're someone like me who's just looking at this film as a film, and you're looking at Joaquin Phoenix, you're looking at every single frame, you're looking and listen, or rather, you're, you're listening to the ethereal, amazing score as these shots are going on. If you want to have, I think, a moment to realize just how brilliant of a movie this is, go to the bathroom sequence. I already have it, you know, this clip everywhere on YouTube. Look at the bathroom sequence where he is doing this dancing movement set to this eerie, eerily beautiful score. And you realize just not only how much Joaquin dedicates himself to this role, but also just how powerful this character is. It's a question. It's a film, rather, that leaves you with a lot of questions. I think it leaves you with more answers than some people might let on. But I think that it's a great take on the villain of the Joker. It's an original take on the Joker. And I think that if we get more films like this, which have low budgets, but big hearts, and great actors, and great writing, and great direction... DC and a lot of the characters from the DC universe 
will be in very good hands. But anyway, those are my top movies of the year. So technically, you got a top 15 list with some five honorable mentions. But what do you think of my top 10? Do you agree with my list? Are there any that you disagree with? Also, let me know. What is your top 10 list of the year? I plan to do a bottom five list of the year in the coming days. Also, I still plan to do my biggest box office successes and my biggest box office bombs of 2019 as well. Still waiting for some numbers to come in on a few movies since some movies released at the end of 2019 and are still making some money coming in. All I can say too is that the reason why Joker has a very special place in my heart and I think pushed itself over the edge of a film like Parasite is because this film being made for $55 million yet still making over a billion when the media went out of their way to attack it and go after it and it also did not have a China release gives this film even more respect. So the film is already great on paper but then I take in those extra X factors and that's what pushed this film over the edge for me. But that's not to take anything away from Parasite. Both of these films are fantastic, and I think both of them would be great watches at any time of the day. So anyway, let me know your thoughts about this and all the things I talked about in the comment section below. If you like this video, smash the like button, give me a subscribe. It helps me out a lot. You're all amazing and beautiful people. Have a wonderful day, and as always... God bless. And now I want to give a shout out to my January Patreon members, Animation Commentator, Brian P, Dion, Divex, Elizabeth M, Enrique Evangelista, Fan Addicts of Film, Father Christopher Miller, Hail Father, Frank the Tank and the Shaw Hand, Wiener Dog Clan, Harold Francis, the Hunky Chunky Funky Monkey, Inflamed Wood, it's a Trap Productions, Jason Clark, Jeffrey Toon, JJ Jonathan Jarembeck, Lady T, Mad Mitch Dunaway, Mr. Peabody and his evil twin, Orange Hat Reviews, Outpost Dyer, Perpetual Punster, Riff Magos, Rosetta Allen, Sir Lancelotto, Theodore Benden, The DJD Show, Those Two Ball Guys, and Tina B, and Sharon Ferguson. Sharon! Thank you so much for being Patreon members. And of course, to my subscribe star peeps, Larry Larry, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, G2 Cool 99, Dark Star 57, J. Alex McCarthy Jr., US 888209Fast, Dean Heiss, Hale Francis, J. Rod the Beer Guru, Nevalon G. Adams, and ZK Man. Thank you so much for supporting me this month. You guys freaking rock.